was my turn to cross the thin ledge. Flat on my belly, I scraped up the 20 foot long three-sided tunnel. The rock that lay above, to my right, and below me had seemed pretty safe and, and reassuring as I watched others pass through it. But once committed, however, all the rock seemed to be pushing me out toward the 2,000 foot exposed drop-off that was just below my left hand. I tried not to think about all the scary thoughts that wanted to creep into my mind at that moment. Like, why am I doing this? How did I get myself to this point? Didn't I promise not to scare myself on these climbs? Don't slip up now. There was only one reasonable choice anyway. Just keep going. And once I started to learn about it and saw that people could climb it, and people do climb it. And then, you know, people climb it on New Year's Day, for heaven's sakes. And I always say, well, gosh, I think we can do it in the middle of summer. You know, we can do this. I remember the first time that I, I saw the Grand. Uh, I was driving just north out of Jackson Hole, and all of a sudden, you just come, you pop out on top of this hill, and, and, and suddenly this unbelievable view of the whole Grand Teton Vista is right there in front of you, and it's just one of the most memorable experiences I can remember uh, in, in the Rocky Mountains seeing that view and uh, never in a million years would I have thought that I would actually attempt to climb the tallest scariest looking mountain up there which the Grand certainly is. I had been looking at it for a lot of years driving past on my way to Yellowstone and always wondered what the view up there would be like and uh, it just it was there it was just looking right at us saying you know come on let's let's do this thing so we figured we'd wait up and do it. Unlike most mountain ranges the Tetons are void of any foothills. They seem to magically rise from the valley floor to nearly 14,000 feet high. The Grand Teton, tallest of the impressive range, climbs to 13,771 feet above sea level and is probably the most eye-catching peak. The eastern face, which is visible from the park highway, looks steep and uninviting to a grade two and three level scrambler like myself. But the west face, although still steep, offers a more doable route for non-technical climbers. Our climbing group included four friends that simply put, wanted to find out if they could climb this long admired summit. This experience would end up motivating us to join together to attempt other adventures in the western states. We knew our backpack up to the lower saddle would be strenuous, but burdened with ropes, harnesses, and climbing hardware, we were carrying the heavy load up to base camp. A bit more attention to our ounces and pounds could have made our day much, much less painful. Once you left Lupine Meadows, every step of the way was uphill. Every step. You know, and it, it hurt. But it was kind of neat because with, you know, going uphill every step, you can turn around and you gain quite a bit of elevation, you know, pretty quick. And uh, it hurt. Of course, we were loaded pretty good. The climb from the trailhead to the lower saddle was probably one of the most physically demanding days of my life. You don't, a lot of climbs will give you some varied terrain where you'll maybe hike through some forest and then you'll open up into some meadows and it and, and then there's some steep parts you're always going up but with the grand your first step was up and it was up all day long mine was the, the backpack in to the upper saddle was probably one of the most difficult days backpacking days of my life it was just almost 5,000 feet up and it was just constantly up you barely got a break it was beautiful but the last few miles, we were just uh, exhausted, and it was, you know, difficult to continue. But we really wanted to make it to the lower saddle, so um, we just uh, kept on trudging. Pretty gosh darn high up here. I'm tired. We're getting whooped, Bill. This hill just whooped me. It whooped me good. We started. See the car that As usual, we were packed heavy, and we had the the added weight of the ropes and harnesses and carabiners, and that always adds 10 or 15 pounds to your pack. And 
Um, so we were traveling heavy and also we had packed for an extra day. We always do that, make sure that you give yourself, try to give yourself two ascent days in case you're weathered out the first day, you still have another shot. You don't want to put in all that effort and then just have one shot at it. Right there. This last part was kind of tough. Okay. Oh, yeah, under. On, I believe the upper part of the moraine, there was a, a yes, big sir. slab of rock, and they had a, a rope this is uh, hanging over the side. We're of the iron this one. And uh, that was a tough one too. with all the weight on your back, it, it was critical to get your balance right. Because the further you lean back, and that's natural on the rock, the further you lean back, the more traction you have. But when you have 80 or 90 pounds on your back, you kind of it's the turtle syndrome. You know, it just wants to keep keep you going. And I don't, I don't remember any major difficulty on that, but I, I remember we were really glad to get on top of that. We could see the glacier at the lower saddle and knew that uh, here in a short time we could set up a tent and kick back and, uh, and ease the pain of the, the back and the legs. And then there are the moraines, and then there is the, the lower saddle. And the lower saddle is half a dozen, maybe eight or ten little tent spots, as I recall, that it's first come, first serve at the Jenny Lake Ranger Station, six in the morning, who's ever the first ones in line that day can get a pass for that night on the saddle. And they go quickly. So Craig went up there for us and, and took care of that. So we got, we got two tent sites on the lower saddle. And that, that's, that's huge. That's, well, let me take that back. Because what that means is you have to carry your packs to that level as well. Camping at the Moraines allows you to take that pack off sooner, but it gives you another, I don't know, hour and a half, maybe two hours the next morning when you do your ascent. So, so there's advantages and disadvantages. We chose the saddle because it's as high as we could get up to camp, and that made the climb shorter the next day. That was the shortest possible climb. And, and it was an awesome view, and we could tell it was going to be an awesome view from the saddle. You could look over into Idaho or back into Wyoming from that spot. It's just a narrow, couple hundred yards square, rocky area where you can pitch up some tents. After a very full day of pulling up the trail, we finally leveled out at the lower saddle where we could rest and throw down some nutrition before trying to get some sleep before climb day. Garnet Canyon is the principal approach to the South, Middle, and Grand Teton summits. Because of the volume of climbers using this area, the National Park Service requires a permit for camping in this steep and stunning drainage. Access to Garnet Canyon is from the Lupin Meadows Trailhead just south of Jenny Lake and climbs nearly 5,000 feet to the popular camp spots on the Lower Saddle. Frequent stunning views of the summit of the Grand give us time to think about what challenges lie ahead. Challenges that none of us have experienced before. Our route tomorrow would actually have an official name, the Owen Spaulding Route. None of us had taken a route with a name before.
Our previous mountaineering adventures had been walk-ups. With a little hands on the rock scrambling, maybe a touch of exposure here and there, mostly level two and three climbs, not a lot of technical climbing necessary. We're basically, uh, we're novice climbers. I, c I don't consider myself an expert climber, not a technical, we're mountaineers, we're not rock climbers. So that was doable for us. There were some places you had to rope up and there were three rappels on the way down. It was a, a very quick uh, evolution of learning. We, we needed to learn how to do certain skills. So uh, none of us really were technical climbers. We didn't have any technical skills. We didn't know how to rappel. None of us had really ever rappelled before, I don't believe. Uh, so we took a class the day before our climb. We took a climbing class and a guy took us out on some rocks and showed us how to tie the knots and how to work our harnesses properly. And, uh, and we did some rappels and we did some basic climbing where we um, used some protection to, to help each other out in, in, in uh, precarious situations. And uh, it gave us enough skills to feel comfortable doing the climb on, on the Owen Spalding route, which is technically fairly simple. So we very much had to pick a route and, and stick with it. Some of the other climbs, the walk-ups, you don't pick a route until you're at the base and you say, well, that looks good, and you just go for it. You pick a line and go. But with the Grand, it's, it's much more well thought out. There are very specific routes, and if you go somewhere other than where you're intending to go, you could run into big danger. So it's, it, it required some, you pay some attention. Indeed. I think the Grand's accessible to just about anybody that you know has has some some good basic skills and some willpower. Uh, you know, again, you you always need to be prepared for the eventuality of, of weather. You know, I mean, you have to be able to survive for a night or two in a in a place that you hadn't planned on. You know, bivouac on a ledge or whatever. And uh, if you're comfortable with that and, uh, and and luck out with some good weather, then uh, then then it's certainly attainable. Uh, it's attainable even with bad weather if you have the patience and the know-how to, uh, to, to weather a night or two out because it's just too dangerous to get up on top and get socked in with the clouds and the weather and, and try to get down. We took a class before our climb day to brush up on skills we would need before our big day. This video is not meant to show you or teach you the correct way to climb the Grand as we are not instructors or very experienced climbers and probably made our share of silly mistakes. It is meant to show you what it's like up there on a perfect weather day and just for sheer entertainment value. Climbing with National Park Service approved guides gives inexperienced climbers an opportunity to reach some high peaks and begin gaining valuable climbing experience. Contact the National Park Service for names and phone numbers. After a very long day in Garnet Canyon, we settled into camp finally with many other climbers camped nearby, hoping we would have enough energy in the morning to make a strong approach for the summit. An early start on climb day is important to avoid potential storms and bad weather that often develop in the afternoon. We awoke to clear skies and a welcoming eastern sky. But uh, boy, those first couple of hundred yards in the morning after a day like we had were tough. I mean, the legs are screaming, the back's screaming. It's like, can I give this rope to somebody? What about all the weight do I have? Maybe I can just slide the camera off on old Ron or Craig, you know? But uh, I remember we, we weren't all in the best of spirits because we we'd worked hard, you know, the day before. We hiked out of camp with written instructions that would hopefully 
guide us to the summit on the Owen Spalding route. We chose the easiest route up the mountain, which was the Owen Spalding route, and, and it was also the first, I believe it was the first ascent on the Grand by Mr. Owen and Mr. Spalding. The Owen Spalding route, first attempted in August 1898 by William Owen, Franklin Spalding, Frank Peterson, and John Shive, is the easiest approach to the summit of the mountain. This route starts from the lower saddle at 11,600 plus feet, which sits between the Middle Teton and the Grand, and climbs to the upper saddle at 13,160 feet plus. As long as the weather is good, a climber's trail provides a safe and easy route to the upper saddle. The major difficulties of the route begin once you are beyond the upper saddle. took a break and changed some clothes and looked down to the most, at that time, the most incredible exposure I had ever seen in my life. It was just breathtaking. And I, I didn't fear falling off, but it sure, uh, it sure ran through your mind, you know? Uh, one little screw up and that's all she wrote. I mean, there's, yeah, there's no coming back. The first challenge was mostly a mental one, negotiating the belly roll. A huge boulder overhang prevents one from standing or even crawling along this ledge. This is a very exposed ledge and just looking over the edge makes one wonder what he's doing here. This 18 or 20 inch wide ledge offered us several options for movement as there are enough footholds a few feet down on the west face to walk along the outside or we could belly scrape along the inside of the ledge and over a rock outcrop until across. Either way, the crawl is an exhilarating experience. Second thing that comes to mind in terms of challenging was exposure. And I had never experienced exposure like that before on any mountain. And, you know, you're on this little belly crawl that's maybe 30 or 35 feet long and you're, you're, you're just squeezed into the rock as much as you possibly can be. And you look over the edge and it's just a two or 3,000 foot drop off. And, and at that point, I'm wondering, why am I doing this? And who got me into this? <laughs> Couldn't have been me. It was the most alive I've ever felt in my life. And there was, there was no turning back. There was no one else controlling your, it was up to you to do it and to keep going through. It was, it was frightening. It was, it was very frightening to me. I've, I've got somewhat of a fear of heights anyway, which is a strange hobby for somebody who's afraid of heights is to climb mountains. I went through first, I think. I went through first. And uh, I turned around and I was videotaping and it was kind of neat because everybody was cracking up and I kind of went on the outside of it, as I recall. Uh, real good lip that I put my hands and I just kind of scurried on the outside. And I remember Bill, and I'm not sure if Ron had crawled in there, but I remember shooting a, a video of Bill right in there. He says, this is where I'm happy. You know, I'm on my belly and I'm not bashful about it. And that's how he went through the crawl and peeked his little head over the side and just, uh, just tremendous. I mean, you have to be there to see it because it's straight down, you know. It's just essentially a crack on the side of a granite face and it's at its largest opening is, I don't know, probably a couple of feet and it, and it narrows down into a wedge again in the, into the rock and the exposure is just dramatic. It's, it's a couple of thousand feet right off the edge and you have to go face first on your belly. Is the, that's the way I did it. I was one with the rock and you just crawl along like a soldier crawling across the field, you know, on all fours on your belly, just slithering through the crack to get to the other side.
<laughs> you hear that piece of pumpkin pie? Now it's my turn. Here we go, Ronnie. We're well, recording. Here I am on the edge of the <laughs> mountain. <laughs> I don't know how I let him talk me into this. This is the crawl, boys and girls. Crawl. I'll show you how it's done, I hope. A little bit of exposure. I like to travel it. And then after looking at it, we could uh, we could see a big uh, a big bulge. It wasn't uh, a trail. It was uh, an outcrop of, of uh, rock that we had to get around to get up to shoot this uh, chimney. And uh, it wasn't real bad. I think I might have went around it first. And we just felt that uh, hey, let's not do anything dumb here and screw up. So we set up a belay around the corner, and we blade everybody uh, around that. From here, we felt the need to rope up for protection in spots since the route gets a bit more technical, but offers some good solid rock and holds. But the difficulty, combined with the exposure, kept our blood pumping at record volumes for quite some time. Where do you go from there, Bill? And here goes Craig. Up the crevasse. We're up the rock ledge. Hello. Get that rope right enough. Hey, uh, you should get that rope out of there, Bill. It's right now. Edge. It's an interesting maneuver. Looks good. While ascending through technical terrain up the west face of the Grand, I couldn't help but think about having to go back down and the new challenges we would have to face. And then at the other end of the rock cropping, as I recall, then you're, you go straight up, vertical, straight up a, a chimney. And that is hand over foot climbing up the chimney. And that's a, that's a fair piece. That was 100 yards up, as I recall. And then almost there. I mean, that, that takes you pretty much to the summit. It was, I was actually surprised at how quick after we got through that second chimney that we were on the top, you know, because I expected uh, more route finding and talking to the guy that had uh, taught us the repelling and, and blading techniques that uh, you always have to remember to, to go left when you think you need to go right and watch out for this and watch out for that, and we didn't. And boom, next thing you know, we're on, we're on top of the grand. Once past the chimney section, we picked our way up rock slabs and chutes, passed one more chimney, and suddenly we were on top. Had, uh, tremendous weather. I was surprised at how big it was and flat Check up on out. top of there. You know, looking at it from the road, you think it's just this one little point that you have to take turns standing on. But uh, it was great. There was more people up there than I had expected, and we had no idea how they came up because we didn't see them, you know, on our route. They probably came up the Exum. But uh, 
Oh, it was a blast. I'm I could here. stay up there all day. We are filming. Two to top. You got what's hey. left? It's a long way down. Oh, no. <laughs> Kinley. Look around you. McKinley. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Get a life. Get on. He's <laughs> trying. The great the steel. Uh, the great state of Wyoming. It's a good state. How about a highway? <laughs> okay, tell us what's around you. All right. Physically, I remember the summit being as small as you think it would be looking at it from a distance. You say, wow, that just like goes to a point. And it does. It's just a very small area on top. And I think there were a half a dozen other folks up there with us. Glorious blue sky, warm, calm. Just a beautiful morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, I think we summited, which was late. Most people are back down off the mountain by that time of the morning. Of course, they start at 4 a.m. and. Like the most memorable part of the whole thing was making it to the top. I mean, that was absolutely, uh, I felt euphoric. I mean, it was, I couldn't believe that we made it. And we were all just real happy and, 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 and felt wonderful. However, I had a, um, an overwhelming fear of coming down as well. I mean, we were going to be doing things that I had never done before, like a free rappel. So although I was euphoric and so happy to be on top, I still had a fear of coming down because half the climb was over, only half the climb. And we still had the second half, which I thought was going to be, maybe even be scarier than coming up. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome at the top of the Grand Teton. This is your announcer, Dr. DJ KR, live and in person from 13,770 feet. This is the benchmark of the Grand Teton off this direction, a drop of about 7,000 feet. So watch that first step. <laughs> off here on the right is the fabulous state of Idaho with Driggs and Victor off in the distance, Table Mountain, Lake Solitude. Mm-hmm. Oh, let me get... Table Mountain. There we go. Okay. Beautiful. Pan back here to the summit. Okay, I'm kind of out of shape. It took me nine hours to get to the <laughs> lo lower saddle this year. And but less than four hours to the top from the lower saddle. Stay there. It's August 14th of 90. The time is 10.22. Four hours. It's not bad, dude. Casual. Casual. Casual rat. Casual, Casual my ass. It was, but it's still a couple fun moments. Sign in the register. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, this is about the best weather you can ever possibly have up here. The averages, the average weather conditions up here. Trapel on the mountain. Move. Bill's going first. And I'm hooked in, so don't worry about me. Down he goes. How those ropes look down there, Bill? There he is. Does, uh, does it go all the way down to the bottom? I mean... The rope's gonna make it? Good. What? And he disappears. One of those ropes is a all slow stepping bone. I like that trick. Yeah, me too. As he lowers into the depths, the deepest.
section of the grand. Well, I can see where this could get stirred. How are we looking down there, Ronnie? Oh, great. There's a man that's moving. A uh, slight trepidation. But it's looking good. Yeah, the first uh, rappels were, um, you were pretty much attached to the rock. And they were perfect warm-ups for the open rappel that was coming up, or the free rappel that was coming up. Because um, we just got a feel for going backwards on your rope and trusting your equipment and trusting the knots that you tied, trusting your harness um, and your partners and, and your protection. You, there was a lot to trust, but it was a good primer to, to what was to come. Let's turn. Chicago Cubs. Descends off the ledge. One step at a time, Atticus. All right, looks good, Bill. You look completely in control. We hit the big rappel, the, the free fall. And uh, I could see a few Adam's apples, you know, starting to bob up and down a little bit. It took a lot of time, made sure that uh, the knots were the way they were supposed to be. We had to tie two ropes together in order to retrieve one, you know, pull one through. going off the rock, not knowing. And I just had, uh, it gives so much trust in all the people that we had talked to that this is the rappel point and it's a free fall and you're fine and you know, don't worry about it. But uh, yeah, it was, it was a big if because you couldn't see a thing. And I believe Craig might've went off first and he was, uh, he was puckered up a little bit, understandably, we all were. And you just step off and then you're gone. And that's the first time you can look over your shoulder and see that you're just hanging. The toughest thing I've ever had to do in my life was, was take those first two steps backwards, tied to a rope, walking backwards over a cliff that you can't see the bottom, and you're looking at 2,000 feet straight down. That was the, that was the single toughest action I've ever had to perform to pull from your gut and to take those two steps. <laughs> Just remember those Lycra things look real good on you, buddy. Great. Yeah. No problem, dude. Casual. Casual. Enjoy it, man. That's a C. Great. <laughs> Not a tremor in my voice. <laughs> there you go. Ah!
scariest part of the rappel for me was you couldn't see the bottom. You, you couldn't see where you were going. And that's probably a good thing because it was over 100 feet. It's 120, 130 feet rappel. So that's a ways down there on the side of a mountain. And, and remember, the exposure is still there. The, the free rappel makes you uh, kind of reaffirm your religious beliefs. <laughs> it makes you think, I hope I have done it. I hope I've been a good boy. Because this, you know, if there were ever a time when you know, something out of my control could end my life very quickly. This would be it. Right. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! That's the most exhilarating thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> and I'm glad you've got that on film. <laughs> Dude, you won't believe it. Woo, buddy! God, I'm excited. Right. Well, Craig, you the first one. Well, actually, the second one. Very nice, it was From the upper saddle, our descent was a simple formality. Now we could relax and begin to absorb everything that we had done in the last 30 hours. All the expectation about what would happen, how scary the climb would be. Would we be turned away by bad weather? Would we take one look at the belly crawl and turn tail? Would sections of the climb be too difficult for us? Would we freeze during the free rappel? Would the rope and knots hold? Would we make it to the summit? All the questions and concerns dissolved into an overall feeling of calming satisfaction. My muscles seemed to relax completely in anticipation of an afternoon and evening of celebration and camaraderie. A long but unrushed hike down the mountain lay ahead tomorrow, but for now, it was time to indulge in the feeling of the moment. Yeah, when we got off the mountain, uh, it was just, once we had finished the free rappel, after that, it was just walking down rock um, and slopes. The, the, we had done that a million times, and I felt perfectly comfortable. So I just felt just an inner peace and a calmness and an excited f feeling that I had done something that I didn't think I could do. Just, uh, just a really good feeling, you know, that, that we had all done this together, and uh, no problems, uh, nobody got hurt. Uh, everybody was pumped up and uh, we knew we didn't have to rush down off the mountain like a lot of people do that we had a, a campsite again for that night that we could just kick back and, and chit chat about the climb and celebrate a little bit and uh, and uh, enjoy yourself and, and that's certainly what we did. By the time we got down to our camp at the saddle it was still a glorious day and then we knew that this baby was in the bag it was, a, it was a hike out now. We had the rest of the afternoon, we got back to camp. It was noon or one o'clock and, and we got back to our camp. We had the whole afternoon to, to revel in our joy. And we knew that it was a done deal. It was, it was a hike out and it was downhill all the way and our packs were lighter from all the food and stuff was gone. So I know getting back down to camp was uh, just a, 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 fu a fulfillment of a dream. We had finally made it and it was time to celebrate. Break out the, uh, uh, the homemade wine and let's have a good time. <laughs>
I got it, buddy. Believe me, that's why I came here. My brother uh, used to be a winemaker and a champagne maker, and uh, I think we had uh, champagne, three or four bottles of wine, and uh, some whiskey, and uh, just celebrated, just celebrated being up there. Ah! Throwing smoke at 12,000. Just you, Bill. You know, under perfect conditions, you're looking at a, a three-day, I would, I would say a three-day climb, one day to get to the lower saddle of the Marines, a day to climb, uh, an evening to enjoy it on top of the lower saddle, and then the next day to, to casually head out. You know, you could, you could certainly do it in two days, but, uh, you know, again, we, we like the time together and, and uh, just enjoy what we did. Basic mountaineering, you have to be familiar with a harness and how it fits and how it goes on and how it's supposed to feel and how to operate it and make sure all the safety features are adhered to. So you need to be familiar with your equipment, carabiners and ropes and, and know how to operate those things. The technical, technical rock climbing skills, not necessarily, at least I don't think we didn't need them. We, were, we knew how to repel, we knew how to belay each other for protection. We knew how to rope up so, so that we would be protected on those areas that, that we did rope up for exposure. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a spooky mountain. It's tall and steep and open. And people die on it. Lots of people die on that mountain every year. Well, not lots of people every year, but over the years, lots of people have died on that mountain. Uh, to be quite honest with you, I thought that the ground was never something that I would climb. I thought it was over my head. I thought it was too technical for me, and it was going to be just too scary. It wasn't something I ever had a great desire to do. I mean, I always wanted to do it, but I never thought that I really would, because the thought of using, I've never been interested in being a technical climber really um, and I didn't know how to use a lot of the equipment and it scared me to think about getting the situations where I'd be that exposed or that vulnerable to the elements to the exposure where I could actually die. Very poor. No, I had no concept of or inclination or even a thought of it as I recall of ever climbing it and then when we started to climb mountains it's nasty little name kept on getting thrown into the mix. We started climbing Gannett and Fremont and these other big mountains. And it was only a matter of time when the Grand was going to have to be attempted. I don't know how much more I want to do that kind of thing because it was really scary. And, and it, was, it was a very draining experience as well, but it was really worth it. Uh, to me, it was more getting, getting good friends together and just doing something together. You know, rather than saying, yep, climb the Grand. You know, it's like, well, me, Ron, Craig, and Bill went out and just, yeah, we did the Grand. We just had a great time.